given us, allowing us to get into your word, to study your word, that we might be guided and directed in our steps and our ways before you. That, Father, uh, we might look to you for our guidance and direction, that we might, uh, uh, Father, be acknowledging you in all of our ways and all of our activities and everything that we are involved in. We're going to be looking at, Father, your word in Psalm 127 today. It's going to guide us and direct us and uh, uh, cause us to understand in whatever activity we're involved in. And whatever activity we're involved in, Father, if we leave you out of the involvement, if we leave you out of the activity, it will be vain and accomplish nothing. Father, uh, we thank you for the salvation that you've wrought through Jesus Christ, your Son. We thank you, Father, for the blessings you continue to shower upon us as your people. We pray, Father, uh, for... uh, Uh, those who attend here in this place that you have provided, that we might, Father, uh, come together with a desire to worship and glorify you and all that you have done, and especially for the salvation through Jesus Christ, your Son. We thank you, Father, for your word, and we pray even, Father, for uh, for, uh, uh, enlightenment this morning as we look into your word, and pray, Father, that as your your uh, word tells us all scripture is inspired by you and profitable for teaching and reproof and correction and training and righteousness that the man of God might be adequate, prepared for every good work. So, Father, we look at your word knowing that there's application to our lives. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we are today in Psalm 127. I haven't been here for a while, so it's been a while since we've been in the Psalms of Ascents. The Psalms of Ascents is 15 psalms. They start in Psalm 120, and they go through Psalm 134. Uh, Four of the psalms were written by David. Uh, One was written by Solomon, and today happens to be that one that is recognized as having been written by Solomon, uh, the son of David. Uh, there, is, there are commentators who indicate that the psalm may have been written by David about Solomon, but we're going to go with a general consensus that it is a psalm written by Solomon. And it's easy to see that because even in the context of the title, it says of Solomon. Uh, If we look at the psalms that we've been looked at, the psalms of ascent so far, Psalm 120 through 126, we can look at the themes that have been uh, brought before the people. Uh, Psalm 121, it looks at the Lord as being the keeper and the guardian or the protector of Israel. Psalm 121 looks at the Lord as being the keeper or the guardian uh, of the nation and uh, the psalmist's understanding that his help comes from the Lord. And I'm sorry, Psalm 120 is for uh, prayer uh, by the psalmist for deliverance deliverance from treacherous evil men and an understanding that that God answers the cries of his people. Psalm 122 is a prayer for the peace of Jerusalem. That's a psalm of David. Psalm 123 looks at the Lord of mercy in the midst of persecution Psalm 124 gives praise to the Lord for personal and national rescue from enemies or troubles. Psalm 125 uh, gives praise to to the Lord for protection and goodness to his people. Psalm 126, what we looked at last time, describes the joy and concern of God's redeemed people. And today we're looking at Psalm 127. Uh, with an understanding that prosperity in several ways comes from the Lord. And it's actually vain to consider that any efforts or activities or or power that we muster together to do things of our own selves is going to be vain. It's going to be like a vapor. It's going to be like a breath. It's here and then it's gone unless the Lord is working in what we do. So we're going to look at Psalm 127, and I'll read uh, for us here uh, 
Psalm 127, prosperity comes from the Lord. It's a song of ascents of Solomon. Verse 1, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor, labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors. For he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They shall not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. Uh, seems like a relatively simple psalm, short psalm, five verses, and I hope we have time to get through it. So <laughs> just be with me. I tend to, as... Uh, one of my brothers would say, go off on a side trail. And it becomes so interesting and so informative that it's easy to stick there. Uh, Psalm 127, verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, they, build, they who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord guards a city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Uh, unless the Lord builds a house... And I looked at this word house, it's uh, bayeth, bayeth. It means house, it means dwelling or habitation, it means shelter or place, it means a location, it means the home or a house containing a family or a household or a family of descendants. It also means a nation or a group of people, as in uh, the house of Israel. This indicates that the Lord is involved intimately in all aspects of life uh, for the Hebrew. And this would probably come to their mind, understanding the word house means so many things. In Psalm 127, uh, essentially it's probably going to mean uh, the city that is built and the family that is raised. And most especially a father, mother, and children that are raised. Uh, but uh, by, by yith, this word for house occurs 1,881 times in the Old Testament as house or dwelling, 54 times as household, 25 times as home, 11 times as the temple, 16 times as prison, uh, 16 times as a place, 5 times as a family, and it's also indicated in the use of for the nation or people of God as in the house of Israel, as I said. Uh, without the Lord being honored and revered in this verse, those who build their house, dwelling, city, home, family, whatever activity they're involved in, if they are building it, if they are sustaining it, maintaining it, apart from the Lord God, it says their labors, are vain. And the word vain, as I said, means, uh, is, uh, means a vapor or a breath. It, it's, uh, it's easy to work hard and to, to feel an accomplishment of what you've done. Uh, that, that's gone in a moment. Uh, sometimes I, I wonder about some of the work that I have done in the past that uh, I got accolades for, or I got accomplishments uh, uh, attributed to me and uh, it's been a short period of time I doubt if anybody remembers those things now but if we are working and we are in our intention is to build and labor and to maintain and guard and protect the activities that we're involved in with the Lord's help it says it will not be in vain it will not be in vain if the Lord is in it I uh, went through and looked at some of the verses that use the word uh, bayith, city, house, family, descendants, lineage, and uh, pulled some out. Two or th a couple of things to note. It's always showing that the Lord is involved in the activity. And number two, there's some really uh, reputed names here uh, that God has been active in helping in these activities. 
Uh, the Lord brings these things to pass. He encourages them. He builds them up. He guards them. He protects them. He guarantees outcomes for them. Genesis 7.1 says, The Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark, you and all your household, household, by yith, uh, for you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. The Lord told Noah, get in the ark. And the Lord closed the door for him. Genesis 12, 1, now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house, his dwelling or his family, to the land which I will show you. God's promise to Abraham, I, gotta, I have a land for you. Calling Abraham out of the uh, out of the land of Gentiles. Genesis 19, 2, And he, Lot, said, Now behold, my lords, please turn aside to your servant's house or dwelling by Ith, and spend the night and wash your feet, that you may rise early and go on your way. So when uh, the angels of the Lord came to the city of Sodom where Lot was living, I was going to say he shouldn't have been there, but God had a purpose for Lot being there. And uh, this is, a, to me, one of the things that he showed is God has his power to lead and guide and uh, put us into predicaments and situations because he is going to perform works for his glory. And he certainly did that, did that with Sodom. Genesis 28, 17, it says, he, Jacob, Jacob uh, uh, had a dream of a ladder going up into heaven and angels going up and descending. And uh, uh, he was so amazed by that, uh, he was afraid. I'd be afraid as well if I thought that that was a gateway into heaven. And he said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, or the city, or the location, or the way, or the place of God's dwelling. And this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, the city of God. Beth and Bethel is a, rooted out of our word Bayeth meaning house, city, place, location. And previously, the city was named Luz. And we, talk, we can talk multiple times about in uh, Chronicles and Samuel about the house of David, the house of Saul. And we can see that in 2 Samuel 3.1, 2 Samuel 9.1, 1 Chronicles 12.29, where God calls and talks to David uh, David about his house and the house of Saul. It is their, their lineage, their dwelling, it could be their city, where they live, their family. Uh, all of these connotations come to the mind, and I can't help but think that the Hebrews that are on pilgrimage going up to Jerusalem, going up to the temple to worship God, to offer sacrifices of thanksgiving for what God has done for the nation, don't have these thoughts in their minds. How many ways has God acted on behalf of his people? And then and, and, and this, this word that is, seems to be a literal, a dwelling place or a habitation or a structure means so much more. And what would that bring to mind for the Israelites? I had to go searching for uh, how many ways it is used and to understand fully and, and not even fully. Uh, how much God has used this, uh, his word in the lives of his people. First Kings 6.1 says, Now it came about after 480th year, after the sons of Israel came out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, which is second, the second month, he began to build the house of the Lord. Right? He began to build the temple of God. So again, we've got a relationship here of, of this word to uh, the activities of men in relation to the Lord. And I, it continues to amaze me how many times and how many places in Scripture 
the people of God, uh, the writers of the scriptures, led by the Spirit, reference coming out of Egypt, coming out of bondage. It's a, it's a thing that's repeated so often that they are to know and understand and remember. And this was Solomon's building the temple. We remember that David wanted to build the temple, gathered supplies, got, to get, got craftsmen in line to be essentially contracted to, to build the structure. And God had the prophet go to, to, to David and tell him, you're not going to build the temple. You're not going to build my place. You're not going to build my bayith. It's not going to be you. It'll be Solomon. So we see God working and speaking and, and intimately involved in the activities of Noah and Abram and Lot and Jacob and David and Saul and Solomon. We see it in Joshua as well. Joshua 21, 44 and 45 it says, And the Lord gave them rest on every side. They went in and did battle in the land. And they drove out the enemies, uh, the Gentiles that had been in the land. And they did all according to what he had sworn to their fathers. So God's actively in, involved in this. He gave them a promise. He told them, you're going to have the land. You're going to go in. You drive out the people of the land. And no one of all their enemies stood before them. The Lord gave all their enemies into their hand. Not one of the good promises of the Lord had made, that uh, the Lord had made to the house of Israel failed. All came to pass. Not one of the promises made to them failed. Uh, and he made those promises to the house, the Bayith, the nation, or the people of God. Verse 1 prompts the people of God who are traveling to the city of Jerusalem to worship at the, in the temple, to offer their thanksgiving sacrifices. He, it prompts them to remember how many ways God has worked in their midst. I don't know that they thought about all of these instances, about all of these ancestors, about all of these activities that God uh, worked through. It was interesting to see that by the use of this one word, to me it draws my mind to these places and these instances and these activities. Please understand, God is, in, is at work throughout the scriptures dealing with his people. And they are instructed by verse 1 to remember that unless the Lord is active, unless the Lord is guarding, unless the Lord is building, that whatever they are going to do will be in vain, be like a vapor, like a breath of air. So the umbrella for the rest of the verses here is that God must be involved in whatever endeavor we find ourselves in. Otherwise, they labor in vain who build it, and they are vigilant in vain guarding it. Does no good. And uh, Charles Spurgeon said, note of this verse, uh, the psalmist does not bid the builder to cease from laboring, and nor does he suggest that the watchmen should neglect their duty, nor that men should show their trust in God by doing nothing. Nay, he supposes that they will do all that they can do, and then he forbids them to rely on their own efforts but they requires that they put uh, their trust in him and realize that all creature effort will be in vain unless the creator puts forth his power. Psalm 127, verse 2. It is futile for you to rise up early, to stay up late, to eat the bread of painful labor. This is how he gives to his beloved, even in his sleep. Uh, this is a repetition of some uh, verses in Ecclesiastes, also written by Solomon. And that's why we're going to see from Proverbs and from Ecclesiastes, both written by Solomon, that it appears and seems most right that this is a psalm written by Solomon. Uh, it is futile for you to rise up. It's vain. 
and uh, vanity of vanity, all is vanity is what we read in Ecclesiastes. It includes any labor that we uh, put forth of our own effort on our relying on ourselves, our own power, our own ability, disregarding God, leaving God out, means that it is a vain work. It's vain to get up early and work hard. He didn't tell us we shouldn't. It's vain if we do so and leave God out of the picture. The umbrella of the verse 1 is that God is at work building, God is at work maintaining, God is at work protecting and guarding. And that's what we're to look to. God's desire is to bless his children. He calls them, this is how he gives to his beloved, even in their sleep, uh, even in his sleep. Uh, (laughs) God's at work 24-7. There's not a time that God is not working, preparing for what is going to come into our lives as situations and activities. And we get to go to sleep at night. And while we sleep, God is at work. Working uh, for his good pleasure and his desire and his will. So we are to rely on him. And it says he gives to his beloved. We need to remember that this is God through the psalmist speaking to God's believing people. Uh, This is not a promise to everyone that God is going to watch out over them, that God is going to build them up, that God is going to guard them and protect them. This is for God's people. Uh, One of the commentators noted that his beloved here may be a playback uh, in... uh, I'll find it sooner or later, but there's a, a, uh, a, a verse that says that Solomon, who was also called Jedidiah, and Jedidiah means the beloved of God. So it seems like there's maybe a play on words here about being the beloved of God. God's desire is to bless his children, his beloved. Yes, it, that verse is First Chronicles 12.25. Solomon, also known as the beloved of God. It's futile to rise up early, to stay up late, to eat the bread of painful labor. He's not saying don't work. Don't work hard. Um, He is saying that when you work, you are to be looking to the Lord God to cover, to guard, and to build. Colossians, if we go to the New Testament, Colossians 3.23, it says, Whatever you do, do your work heartily. As for the Lord, rather than for men or for yourself, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. We are not to work. Even as the psalmist understood, he was not to work and have painful labor and work long and late and rise early. We are, he is to work hard, relying on the Lord, guiding and directing his steps. We are to do exactly that as well. We're to work heartily as if from our soul. And we're to do it as if we're doing it to the Lord. How can we ever do any activity well enough to be, <laughs> to be acceptable to the Lord? It's what we strive for. It's what our desire is. We're to do it heartily because it is the Lord Jesus Christ whom we serve. It is our Savior, God's Son. And we are to work on this earth in everything well and heartily as if we're doing it for him. Psalm 127 verse 3. We have children in here. That's good. Children, you need to understand. Psalm 127 verse 3 says, Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Children, you're a gift. You're a reward that's given to a family for a reward. Uh, J. Montgomery Boyce said, The Hebrew would ask, why is this house being built if it is not for the family? Why are the watchmen protecting the city if not for the families that live in it? 
Then as now, the family is the basic unit and the most important element of society. If it is vain to act to build a house without God or watch over a city without depending on God to preserve it, then it is even a greater folly to try to raise a family without God. The Israelites understood the Lord preserved and protected his people, and the Lord brought about uh, uh, children to the families. And if they were obedient and trained them and nurtured them and raised them in the admonition of the Lord, then uh, that is, the Lord is pleased with that. But children, you're a gift. You're a heritage. You're a reward. Psalm 127, 4 says, Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Uh, David Guzik uh, gave an analogy of arrows and children. Uh, his analogy is this. Arrows, I mean, you just can't break a branch off of a tree and put a notch in it and pull it back with a bow and let it fly and expect it to go anywhere near what you're aiming at. just isn't going to happen. Uh, David Guzik said the uh, arrows must be shaped they must be formed. They must be guided with skill and strength. They must be given care or be, be taken care of well. They must be maintained. They must be aimed and given direction. And they are an extension of the warrior's strength and accomplishment and have potential for both good and evil. And considering this, we need to understand that uh, like arrows in the hand of a warrior, a warrior who relies on that arrow for uh, uh, protection and guarding. Uh, we are to raise up our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Your parents have a tremendous responsibility to raise children, to direct them, to guide them, and they're always to be pointing them to the Lord God because the Lord God is the Lord of salvation. The responsibility, how, how do you do that? Oh, well, if we went to Proverbs, the book teaches, uh, teaches how to raise a child, what information to give him, how to teach him, and we're going to go there. I mean, for Proverbs verse one or chapter 1, verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It starts there. Children need to be raised in the fear and admonition of the Lord because that is the beginning of knowledge. It's the beginning of knowledge. Uh, fools despise wisdom and instruction. Why do fools uh, despise wisdom and instruction? Wisdom and instruction and knowledge come from the Lord. Uh, fools say in their heart, there is no God. Uh, don't be foolish, children. Don't be foolish. Understand that your parents have a desire for you to, be, to come to know the Lord, to be able to say, be saved by the Lord, and is their desire to teach you, give you instruction, give you under, have you have understanding and knowledge of God's word that you may be wise in all that you do. Uh, verse 8 of Psalm, uh, Proverbs 1, Hear, my son, your father's instruction. And do not forsake your mother's teaching. Mothers and fathers have a responsibility to raise their children in the admonition of the Lord and the teaching of the Lord and the nurture of the Lord. Indeed, they are a graceful wreath to your head and ornaments about your neck. Direction is again given in verse 11, not to allow sinners to entice you. Uh, they're not to, you're not to get in the midst. You know what? Bad company corrupts morals. That's a handy little moral I don't know how many times I heard it in my youth. I didn't realize that it's actually uh, indicated in the scripture in, in Proverbs chapter 1. Don't allow sinful people to entice you to sin. Verse 15, do not walk in the way of the sinners and keep your path from them. Don't put yourself in the midst of people who are sinful. Uh, verse 22, don't put your yourself in the place of scoffers. Scoffers delight in themselves. 
They don't delight in building anyone up, of in encouraging anyone, of guiding, directing, pointing people to God. Scoffers are foolish as well. They don't believe that there is a God. And fools hate knowledge. And believe me, parents have an awesome responsibility of raising their children in the knowledge of the Lord. And that is their desire. If they are loving God, if they are believing in God, and if they are trusting in God, they desire the same for their children. I don't think you understand, I don't think we understand how much labor, effort, and prayer goes into raising of children. In verse 33 of chapter 1, the goal of the instruction of Solomon to his son says, But he who listens to me shall live securely and will be at ease from the dread of evil, and live in me as in the Lord. That's the desire of the parents for their children, if they are believing parents. I'm going to have to go to Proverbs chapter 3. Verses 1 to 6, it brings it as a summary. Okay. I have a caption summary as the rewards of wisdom. It says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God as well as men. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. Uh, Believe me, I I grew up thinking that uh, in many ways my mom and dad just didn't understand, didn't know, didn't under, did, did, couldn't possibly uh, give me wise information on how to live my life. I knew all, well, I was a child. I was a child. And uh, we're not to lean on our own understanding. But we're to gather about with, uh, uh, if we are children, we are to be uh, listening to the admonition and the nurture of our mother and our father. If we're in a church body, we have a church family, we gather together uh, so that we might be uh, uh, built up and encouraged and have a, uh, be like iron sharpening iron in the scriptures, understanding what God has said we need to understand and guiding us. And, and we're not to lean on our own understanding. We lean on this understanding that comes from the word of God. That's not popular today. Uh, if anything, it's, uh, it's being attacked today. If we are believers, if we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and we're walking a sanctified life, our desire is to do what God has for us to do. We are to do what God says is right and wrong to do. We're not to lean on our own understanding, our own thoughts, uh, what others around us in the culture tell us. God has told us what is true and right and profitable. That's why verse 6 ends, In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Verse uh, Proverbs 22, verse 6 says, Train up your child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. It's an admonition to the parents to train their children, to discipline their children, to guide and direct their children. But we need to remember this is under the umbrella of uh, verse 1. If God's not in it, if God's not building, if God's not guarding, if God's not protecting, our efforts will be in vain. So it's always under the umbrella, uh, both of the one directing and guiding and the one that is learning and listening. Ephesians 6.4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children 
to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Don't provoke. Don't exasperate. Don't rouse to anger. This is, a, this is an awful balance. We are to be giving God's truth, directing and guiding as God tells us to, and that's not always acceptable. We're not to provoke our children, however. We're not to exasperate them. We're to remember that uh, uh, they are children and they are maturing and they are growing. Uh, we are to bring them up in the nurture. That's training or growth or maturing and discipline. Admonition is giving attention to, directing them, instructing them. We are to be giving God's word. We are to be directing the children toward God's word and toward the Lord. That is what we are to do in, guide, in uh, building our household. And we bathe all of this in prayer. We bathe this in prayer because it is necessary that the Lord works a work in our hearts and their hearts. Colossians 3.21, fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart. I mean, it's easy for children to become disheartened. Like they're always doing what is wrong. It's a difficult balance to walk. For believing parents, uh, we are to be shaping and molding and guiding and directing and leading our children to the Lord. Children, you have a responsibility. Your parents have an awesome responsibility. You have a hard responsibility as well. Uh, Deuteronomy 5.16 says, Honor your father and your mother, as the Lord God has commanded you that your days may be prolonged and that it may go well with you. That's a repetition also of Exodus 20, verse 12, and it's repeated in Ephesians 6, verses 1 to 3, where, where you're, we are told that you're to obey your, parent, your father and your mother and the Lord for this is right. It's just right to do. It is what God calls. Again, all of this is under the umbrella of God being in, a, in the relationship, of God being in the household, of God leading and directing and guiding. Bathed in prayer. Pray, children, pray for your parents. Pray that they would be led and guided by God. Pray that they would have patience with you. Pray that you can speak to them freely and, 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 and uh, understand what they are trying to get you to, to, to see in God's word. Honor your father and your mother and train up a child in the way that they should go. This is how we. This is how the analogy of uh, the arrow is related to the raising of children, the raising of a household, the raising of a family, the bayeth. Psalm one twenty seven verse five: Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them; they will not be ashamed when they speak to the, with their enemies in the gate. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. If you have one child. And a child is a blessing, a child is a gift, a child is a reward. A lot of children has a lot of blessing and a lot of reward. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full. Uh, they will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. If you raise up your child accord, uh, according to God's word, if uh, the child believes in the Lord God for salvation through Jesus Christ, uh, then even if you stand in the gate and you speak, are speaking with your enemies, I mean, standing in the gate, is, it was a place of justice and it was the place of business, and prominent people sat in the gate of the city. Uh, your, your children will become prominent. They will not be ashamed of what they speak when they speak with their enemies in the gate. We, we rely on God's word, and believe me, there's a lot of enemies in this world directly to Scripture, and it is getting to be more and more so in the United States of America. And we must stand on the word, and we must hold to the word and cleave to the word. 
shortcut is it is by the word that God guides and directs our steps each and every day. There is a uh, German proverb that was cited by Charles Spurgeon, and it says, many children make many prayers, and many prayers brings much blessing. I wanted to change that a little bit and say, any children make many prayers, and many prayers bring much blessing. I know whether they are yours or whether they are grandchildren or whether they, whether they are children of friends or children that you influence in any activity that you are involved in, all of it should be under the umbrella of expecting the Lord God to be building and the Lord God to be directing and the Lord God to be protecting and guarding. Uh, my heart goes out to teachers. I don't know how you do it. So many children over such long periods of time, uh, so different in personalities. Uh, I, I only had four children, and I, uh, saying only four <laughs> is not what I meant. Uh, many prayers go up, and I have to tell you, uh, my oldest son is over 40 years old. I pray for my oldest son. My desire is for him to be solid in the faith, looking to the Lord God to direct and guide him in his steps and his ways, and in leading and guiding and directing his children, my grandchildren, actually both of my sons. Many prayer. Many children make many prayers, and many prayers bring much blessing. May not seem like it at the time. I know sometimes we're uh, virtually crying over the issues and the situations that come up in families. But our desire should always be to be in prayer to the Lord God because it is he who will build and it is he who will guard. It's he who will direct and guide. He's the, our strength. I, we can't do this without him. All because we are desirous of doing his will. So that's all I have. I actually ended up two minutes early. I'm very surprised. I'm going to go ahead and close this in prayer. If any of you have any questions, please let me know. Father, we thank you for this day and the blessings you've given us. We thank you for this Psalm uh, 127, whereby your people are, are given the understanding, Father, that no, no activity, no accomplishment, no situation comes to a fruitful end unless, Father, you are in it. We are to look to you for our guidance and our direction, for your building of our, our, of our activities. Father, I pray especially for families. I pray for the parents, Father, that they would be led and guided and directed by your Spirit, uh, that they would have a desire to teach their children that they would have a desire to nurture and admonish them in your word, that they would direct them and guide them uh, to you, Father, who, is the, who, Father, is the God of all salvation, and that salvation comes through Jesus Christ, your Son. And, Father, we thank you for that salvation, and we thank you, Father, that in all things you are sovereign and you are in control, and we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Are there any questions? <laughs>